Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House of Provincetown, where we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and where we support each other on our spiritual search for truth and meaning. My name is Reverend Kate Wilkinson, and I'm so glad that you are here. Welcome to those of you in the room, and welcome also to those of you joining us via our live stream. Today's service is called Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. But before we begin, I have just a few announcements to share. First, let's be kind to those who show up at noon. (laughs) We'll give them coffee. Also, I want to thank John Thomas for filling in at such short notice for Mary this morning. Thank you, thank you. And we hope Mary, Mary feels better soon. A reminder that we have a wonky piano for the next few weeks. We're working on it. Thank you, Brenda. Um, Also, Easter is coming up on March 31st. So we will be having a family-friendly worship service followed by an Easter egg hunt on our lawn. And if you can help the Easter Bunny to get ready for that, that would be very helpful. You can drop off plastic eggs, individually wrapped candy, and tiny toys here at the Meeting House over the next few Sundays. And check your email for invitations about when we're going to fill and hide those eggs. Our Soul Collage Card Workshop continues tomorrow at 2.30 downstairs in A.B. Hall. That's part of our Winter Spirituality Series. Maybe you saw in the news that our UUA headquarters in Boston is hosting guest families to try to help with this housing crisis in Boston. Not something to be really proud of. The families staying there need diapers and other baby gear, including warm clothing. So let me know if you'd like to contribute and I can connect you to that effort. This emergency shelter is being run by the United Way so you can also donate money directly to them. Many of us are feeling very overwhelmed and heartbroken by the violence in Gaza, and we are looking for spaces to talk about it and actions to take. UU Mass Action, which is a statewide network of UUs, is hosting a Zoom meeting on Tuesday at 12.30 for folks to come together around this. I sent out an email to our folk list yesterday, so please check that email for more details if you're interested in joining that Zoom gathering. And what did I recommend last week for staying centered and grounded when the world gets to be too much? A hobby with a beginning and an end, right? Something measurable, uh, like a puzzle. Well, the Keys family have donated a pile of puzzles to give out today at coffee hour, so you can do just that. If you'd like to bring one of these home with you for some comfort and companionship, please do, and thank you, John and Dana. Finally, if you are attending in person this morning, we invite you to our coffee hour downstairs in Acker Bosworth Hall following the service. Now let's take a moment to affirm our community's covenant. You can find this on the little purple laminated cards in your pews, or you can just listen line by line as I say it. I invite you to repeat each line after me. Love is the spirit of this meeting house. house. This This is our great covenant. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, love. and to help one another. And And now as we light our chalice here in the sanctuary, I invite those of you who are joining us from home to light a candle wherever you are. In that way, we can feel connected even while we are apart. And this morning, I invite Betsy and Karen to light our chalice. Thank you, Karen. Our chalice lighting this morning is by Martha Kirby Capo. Through the week, this chalice abides, 
cupped and silent. Softly it gleams in a dimly lit room, complete unto itself. Today, we come together as a community of faith. Our individual energies combine to spark the flame of truth. May we each draw strength for the other. And like the chalice, may we be bathed in the fire of commitment to social action, equity, and peace. Won't you please join me now in singing our opening hymn number 315, This Old World. Now I've been drawn to this hymn for the last few weeks actually, but I didn't pick it because we don't know it. Uh, but I keep coming back to it and it's not really that hard. It's an old American folk tune and Kenneth tells me it is sung a lot by the Quakers. So visitors, we don't know this one either. But please join us in singing number 315 in our gray hymnals, This Old World, and Brenda is going to play it all the way through for us before we sing. Please rise as you are able. seated. I invite you now into a time of meditation and prayer. During this time or at any time during the service, you are welcome to light a silent candle at the table to the right of the pulpit, where there is a journal to record your thoughts and prayers. After the prayer, we'll sing together Spirit of Life, hymn number 123, which you can also find printed on the purple laminated cards. We'll sing it first in English and then in Spanish. Our prayer this morning is by Reverend E.B. Buki Saunter. Spirit of love, love which holds us, we gather in reverence and thanks for you. We are grateful for the gift of another breath and for each moment of connection, beauty, and truth. Cry with us in our pain for the world. Remind us that we are loved just as we are. Remind us that we are connected with all that is. Remind us that we do not journey alone. Give us what we need for today. Call us back to our promises, commitments, and values. Help us love ourselves and each other, and to show that, that love in our actions. Make us instruments of justice, equity, and compassion. 
We declare that life and love are stronger than tyranny and fear, that a world of beauty and love is coming, and we must shape it together. May it be so. Amen. reading this morning is by Reverend Patrick O'Neill, adapted by Pat Hortdorfer. It's called How Are the Children? In Africa, no tribe was considered to have warriors more fearsome or more intelligent than the mighty, mighty Maasai. It is perhaps surprising then to learn the traditional greeting that passed between Maasai warriors, Kasarian Injira one would always say to another, it means, and how are the children? It is still the traditional greeting among the Maasai, acknowledging the high value that the Maasai always place on their children's well-being. Even warriors with no children of their own would always give the traditional answer, all the children are well, meaning, of course, that peace and safety prevail, that the priorities of protecting the young, the powerless, are in place, that Maasai society has not forgotten its reason for being, its proper functions and responsibilities. All the children are well means that life is good. It means that the daily struggles of existence do not preclude proper caring of the, their young. I wonder how it might affect our consciousness if in our culture we took to greeting each other with this daily question, and how are the children? Not your children, but the children, 
all the children. I wonder if we heard that question and passed it along to each other a dozen times a day, if it would begin to make a difference in the reality of how children are thought of or cared for in our own country. I wonder if every adult among us, parent and non-parent alike, carried an equal weight for the daily care and protection of all the children in our community, in our town, our state, our country, and what that would look like. I wonder if we could say truly, without any hesitation, the children are well. Yes, all the children are well. What would it be like if religious leaders began their every worship service by answering that question? If every town leader <clears throat> had to answer the same question at the beginning of every meeting? And how are the children? Are they all well? If every business leader and corporate executive had to answer the same question at the beginning of every workday, and how are the children? Are they all well? Wouldn't it be interesting to hear their answers? What would it be like? I wonder. I wonder. Please join me in singing our next hymn it's number 318, We Would Be One. You'll remember the tune from last week, but it's different words. Number 318 in the same gray hymnals, We Would Be One. Please rise as you are able. Seated. Now is the time in our service where we take a collection for the ongoing support of this meeting house and our shared ministry. As we enjoy a musical reflection by our choir, we welcome your donations here in the sanctuary or online through PayPal or Venmo. You can find that information on our website, uumh.org, and there are QR codes in the pews as well. At this point, I invite Augie and two other volunteer ushers forward for the collection on and off site. Your offerings will now be gratefully received. Thank <laughs> you. 
Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. I've memorized these lines, Leslie Becknell writes. I imagine many of you carry similar words in the recesses of your memory. I learned some of these words by heart, Leslie says, because I was instructed to or found it convenient. Some words just weaseled their way in there and took up residence. In my early years as a Unitarian Universalist, Leslie says, a minister challenged the congregation to learn by heart the seven principles and promised a prize to anyone who could successfully recite them. So Leslie set out to memorize the principles, and she quizzed herself in the car with her handy pocket card as a prompt on the seat next to her. Okay, we Unitarian Universalists affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. That one's easy to remember. Justice, equity, compassion. Justice, equity, and compassion in what? Oh yeah, in human relations. Then something about encouraging spiritual growth. Then there's one that kind of sounds like the Pledge of Allegiance, but not quite. The goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And finally, the interdependent web. I know that one. Whew, I did it. I learned them by heart, Leslie says. Pretty much. She didn't think she really merited a prize, but she was glad that she had put in the effort to learn the principles by heart. Learn by heart. Except that her heart wasn't really involved in this exercise, she admits. I was using my mind and occasionally my eyes, glancing toward my cheat sheet, Leslie says. It was an academic exercise rather than a spiritual practice. The principles remained abstractions to me, she said, were the aspirations that didn't really affect me. I didn't feel any different for having recited them. What would it be like to really accept one another, to genuinely practice equity and compassion in 
the human relations with the actual humans in my life, she wondered. And as she genuinely imagined that possibility, she says, she could feel something shift in her body. She could feel her heart open. It felt different to consider the principles this way. There were certain words that had an impact on her. Dignity, compassion, search for truth, web. So there she was driving down the highway, feeling her heart opening at the thought of her life with genuine compassion, honoring their inherent worth and dignity. It felt good, it felt hopeful. Until suddenly two lanes of traffic ahead were closed and people had ignored the signs and they were cutting in front of her. Leslie's heart immediately (laughs) clamped shut. She started expressing her righteous outrage at these inconsiderate bozos. No compassion for what might be going on for them, how they might be feeling. These weren't people with inherent worth and dignity in those cars. They were jerks. (laughs) She realized it wasn't so easy to carry these principles in her heart rather than on the paper. The academic exercise of memorizing the words was much simpler than actually changing how she thought about and treated her fellow human beings. As I considered the challenge of moving the principles out of the theoretical realm and into the sphere of everyday living, Leslie says, I remembered a challenge from another Unitarian Universalist minister, Harry Meserve. If you were arrested for being a Unitarian Universalist, he asked, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Now, I know this is a bit of a problematic metaphor, given how inequitable our justice system is. But the question made quite an impact on Leslie, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it either. If I were arrested for being a Unitarian Universalist, would there be enough evidence to convict me? Do the principles or these shared values actually show up, not on the page, but in my actions, my priorities, my relationships, the way I live my life? Because in and of themselves, these words and graphics and statements don't have a lot of meaning, even if we memorize them. They have meaning only in the way that they are lived out. Now, this is the last Sunday in our sermon series about the proposed shared values of Unitarian Universalism as depicted on this lovely pinwheel. We've explored each word. Well, actually, in a second, we'll explore the last word, equity. We've, given a great, we've been given a great mnemonic tool for memorizing them. Remember? Jet pig. Good. And we've done a lot of reflection about how each one relates back to the word love. But the real work of this sermon series is just beginning. The real work of our faith is to live out these values in our everyday, to reflect them in our lives, and to work toward a congregation, a community, a world, that reflects them too. But let's complete the circle, shall we? Let's talk about equity. This word is in the news a lot lately because of the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts that many institutions and communities are involved in. And I think we're pretty clear about what diversity means and inclusion, but what about that middle word? And I need some help exploring equity this morning. Particularly, I need some help distinguishing the ideas of equity from the ideas of equality. 
They sound kind of similar, but they aren't the same. So to do this, I'm going to ask my helpers to step up on into my equality infirmary. Dr. Kate is in the house. Here, okay, this is the waiting room. Welcome to the Equality Infirmary. Equal care is our priority. Betsy, what seems to be the trouble? I just have a cut on the back of my hand. Oh, that's a nasty gash, yeah, okay. Uh, I have something for you. I think this will be just the ticket. That's good, right? That, that's gonna heal in no time, thank you. Ellen, what seems to be the trouble this morning? I have a really bad headache. Oh, a headache. Oh, those are the worst, and it affects your concentration, and painful, right? Oh, I have something for you. Actually, just give me your hand. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Who's next? Char. Oh, wow. Char, what is happening with you today? Oh, I think I broke my leg. Oh no, that looks really painful. So hard to get around. Yeah, I have something for you. Give me your hand, yeah, okay. There you go. Yeah, see you back in a week. Oh, Deb, what's the matter today? I have a belly ache. Uh, could have been breakfast, or maybe you're anxious about being in front of a crowd. Uh, belly aches are tough, but I have something for you. Can I see your hand? Yeah. Oh. There you go. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming to the Equality Infirmary. Equal care is our priority. So, do you feel you got equal care? I treated you all equally. Do you feel you got equitable care? I didn't do anything for you. I treated Ellen pretty well with a hand and then Oh, Betsy, I put Betsy with her hand and she's good. That didn't help though, huh? So, what did we learn about equity and equality? Not the same, right? Treated you all equally and only Betsy's going away feeling better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. You're beginning to get the idea right. Equality means each individual or group is given the same resources, opportunities, or care. Equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and will need different things, and it allocates resources, opportunities, and care needed to reach an equal outcome. You saw how that played out at the Equality Infirmary. Let's look at a few other examples. Here's a case study. It's one month into the COVID-19 pandemic, and in Prince George's County, some families are struggling more than others. You see, some of the students have computers and access to the internet at home, but many of the low-income students do not which makes it pretty impossible for them to keep up with online school. A local nonprofit wants to help, so they raise money to give each student in the county a laptop. Everyone gets one. So great, right? So generous. But you know what? The kids who didn't have access to the internet still don't have access to the internet, so they can't really use the laptops to attend the Zoom classes. And all that money has been used up buying all those computers, so there's no extra funds left over to provide students with a Wi-Fi hotspot that would help them. It was a generous project. It was equal, but it didn't solve the problem it was trying to address. How else could they have done it? 
using a model of equity rather than equality? What if that same nonprofit allocates funds to supply the students without internet access, laptops, and Wi-Fi hotspots, but does not give hotspots or laptops to the students who already have access to these tools? Now all the students have the tools they need for virtual learning. What they are giving out is not equal, but what they are providing is equal access. And that's equity. The thing is, equity is a little more complex than equality because it dwells in the gray areas. It has to do with fairness. And to be honest, we each see fairness differently. Equity requires people to make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis rather than depending on one rule that is decided ahead of time. Here's another example. It seems fair that when giving a test, each student is given the same amount of time to complete the test. We can't like give our favorite students a little more time than the others. That wouldn't be fair. So we make a rule. Everyone gets one hour for this test. But what if one of our students has a learning disability or another disability? Equality says that each student should be able to go to school and take the test no matter their race, gender, or class, that each student gets one hour to take it. But equity says some students have good reasons for needing a little extra time or for needing the test to be read aloud to them or allowing them to mark the answer right on the test instead of filling in a bubble on a separate sheet of paper. The purpose of the test, after all, is to assess their knowledge and grasp of the subject. The purpose of the test is not to see how quickly they can read or how good they are at lining up numbers and letters on a completely separate sheet of paper. That's not what we're testing, right? Equity can be so hard for us to get on board with because we like rules. We like things to be the same for everyone. We have been taught growing up that equality is what makes things fair, and that having rules set ahead of time is what ensures that fairness. But let me give you one last example. Now, this one is from right here in our community. And forgive me if any of you are on the licensing board, because I'm going to take this example from one of your meetings last year. And I'm using this as an example because it is one that challenged me. And I thought about it for a long time before I really understood what equity meant in this situation. If you want to have an event at the Bas Relief, the lovely green space behind Town Hall, you need to apply for a special entertainment license. And there are rules about how late your event can go. Amplified music has to be over by 10.30 p.m. because there are neighbors who live near the Bas Relief and it's only fair that they be able to go to bed at a reasonable hour. This makes total sense to me. And it makes total sense that this rule should apply to everyone. That's fair, right? Well, last April, an event organizer appeared before the licensing board and asked if they could receive special permission to go past 1030. They wanted to go till 1230. And this was for an event for Jamaican Independence Day, which is a very special day for Jamaicans. And the problem with the 10.30 p.m. end time was that many of the Jamaicans in our community work until at least 10 o'clock in our Provincetown restaurants. Actually, many of them work three or four jobs, and they are servers and chefs and dishwashers, and their shifts do not end until after the dinner rush. So if they work until 10 and then get to the celebration at 10.15 and it ends at 10.30, that effectively means that they do not get to celebrate Jamaican Independence Day. Now, another way that this important celebration could be made possible is if employers gave their Jamaican employees that day off. Like, I have the 4th of July off from my job every year so that I get to celebrate. And the reality is, 
that if every Jamaican in this town took Jamaican Independence Day off, our businesses would come to a screeching halt because our town really depends on Jamaican workers. Right now, we couldn't run this place without them. And I think it's a good thing to realize that. And I think it might be good for us to have to shut down on Jamaican Independence Day. But many people do not agree with me. Businesses need to make money. People need their cocktails. So this was not what the organizers were asking for. The request was for a two-hour extension of the event time. And they recognized the reason for that 1030 rule and totally understood it. So before the licensing committee meeting, they went to the neighbors. And they asked the neighbors if they would mind for one night of the year if the end time for events at the bar relief could be extended so that Jamaican community members could celebrate after their shift. And the neighbors agreed. They didn't mind. And you know, the licensing board was very sympathetic to this request, but they were worried about precedent and they were worried about equality. If you make an exception for one group and don't make an exception for another group, it's not fair. The rule had to be applied equally. And in the end, equality trumped equity. They were given the entertainment license, but only till 10.30 p.m. And I heard about this because I am on the Juneteenth planning committee. We are a racially diverse group of activists in town, and we occasionally get involved in things beyond the Juneteenth event, especially if we see that marginalized voices need some amplification. So we talked about this dilemma at one of our meetings. And you know what? I was embarrassed because while most of the members of the committee were immediately on the side of the Jamaican Independence Day organizers, I wasn't sure. I really like rules. And I have been so totally steeped in the ideas of equality that I sometimes struggle to understand the concepts of equity, especially when equity means making exceptions to rules. So if you are hearing this story and coming to the defense of the licensing board, you get no judgment from me. I am you. But I invite you to stew on this for a while, which is what I have been doing. I've been stewing on this one, and one of the things that I've realized is that I really like rules because most of the time, rules work in my favor. They put some boundaries on me, sure, but they also protect me. They give me rights. But what if I grew up in a different social location where the rules were not built in my favor? Where historically, rules have been used to keep me out, to keep me down. Maybe then I would find the rules keeping the status quo frustrating. And I would find them unfair instead of fair. So you don't have to decide right now. And also, the decision has already been made, and we are not on the licensing board. So there's that. But let it percolate. Let it trouble you. Because the goals of equity can trouble our notions of equality. But the goals of equity can also make our communities more inclusive and more accessible to a greater number of people than equality can. Ann Lou Keller wrote a piece a few years into the COVID-19 pandemic called How to Make Friends During the Apocalypse. And she said this, I don't want to get complacent. I want to remember the lessons I started learning during all this. To ask myself, what am I willing to give away or give up in order to prioritize a collective over my own little bubble? 
How might we take turns with regard to who gives or receives more from time to time? Or even recognize that some will just need more support, period. And how can I lean into the larger implications of these questions? How much more am I willing to give from my own resources? And in this giving up, what might I also be gaining? Here is what the proposed Article II revision says about equity. Equity. We declare that every person has the right to flourish with inherent dignity and worthiness. We covenant to use our time, wisdom, attention, and money to build and sustain fully accessible and inclusive communities. Equity. Now, I keep saying this about our shared values, but equity is aspirational, meaning I know we're not there yet. And that's in part because some of the people who would open our eyes to what makes a place accessible and inclusive aren't here yet. And their voices aren't at the table yet. So we need to build a longer table. And we won't be perfect at it, but we can strive to do it with love. And we can keep at it and keep at it until one day, when asked, we can honestly say, the children are well. Yes, all the children are well. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. Thank you, Kate, for that wonderful series, exploring all the uh, components of the pinwheel. <laughs> so it's our practice to ask a question based on the service today. And this can be something you carry in your heart through the week and ponder. Um, come to coffee hour if you're in the room and schmooze on this question. Um, or come to Tuesday night Zoom coffee hour, which is really wonderful to share some deeper dive into the question. And so I'm going to list the, the, uh, the <laughs> what do we call them? Shared the shared values. And I'm going to ask which one is speaking the loudest to you, either because it challenges you or resonates with you. Love. Justice equity, transformation, pluralism, interdependence, and generosity. So which of these is speaking the loudest to you, either because it's a challenge or resonates with you? Thank you. Thank you for coming this morning. I'll end with these Closing words. This old world is full of sorrow, full of sickness, weak and sore. If you love your neighbor truly, love will come to you the more. Go in peace.